The redshifts we looked at last time suggested that the Earth was the centre of everything. But this was actually nothing new. Scientists had been finding one observation after another which showed that the Earth must be a special body in a special position. Tycho Brahe, a famous Danish astronomer, built an observatory with excellent state-of-the-art equipment. He could make observations ten times more accurately than any astronomer before him. He claimed that his observations all fitted the idea that the Earth does not move. The sun and moon go around the Earth and everything else moves round the sun. Galileo famously supported a theory which Copernicus picked up from Aristarchus of Samos. He said the Earth moves round the sun. But when Galileo was asked to prove it, he couldn't. He couldn't refute Brahe's model. As far as I know, nobody ever has. The British astronomer Royal, James Bradley, observed that a star called Gamma Draconis appeared to move in a tiny ellipse each year. He explained this as a result of the Earth going around the Sun. But at that time there were still people who knew of Brahe's model. An Italian scientist, Ruggiero Boscovich, pointed out that Bradley's observation gave a way to prove who was right, Galileo or Brahe. All that was needed was to fill a telescope with water. Light travels one and a half times slower in water than in air, so on Bradley's explanation, the Earth going around the Sun, the ellipse should be one and a half times bigger. This would support Galileo, but if the ellipse remained the same size, it would support Brahe. Well, for a long time, nobody bothered to do Boscovich's experiment. After all, everybody knows that the Earth goes round the Sun. But the famous French scientist, François Arago, put a plate of glass below the eyepiece of his telescope. He found that when he moved the plate of glass, the image of the star was dragged along with it. He could explain all the observations if the Earth is stationary. He could not explain them if the Earth is moving, and neither could anybody else. So the new British astronomer royal, George Biddle Airy, decided he'd better do Boscovich's experiment after all. He filled the telescope with water and started observing. Everybody had agreed that if the ellipse was one and a half times bigger, it would confirm that the Earth goes round the Sun. But if the ellipse stayed the same size, it would confirm that the Earth is stationary. The ellipse was exactly the same size. The Earth was not moving. This didn't persuade the astronomers to abandon the idea that the Earth goes round the Sun. They explained the result away by the ether, the all-pervading medium of space. The light must have been partially dragged along with the ether. It must have been dragged just the right amount to give no change in the size of the ellipse. Secular scientists are very good at making up stories when their theories give the wrong answers, but they almost never admit their theories could be wrong. The movement of the Earth should cause rotation of the plane of polarization of light. Eluthier Mascar did experiments to measure this rotation. He found none. The Earth was not moving. Lord Rayleigh later confirmed his results. The Earth was still not moving. Theodore de Coudre did an experiment using coils, which should have shown mutual inductance if the Earth was moving. The results said the Earth is not moving. Truton and Noble did another experiment, this time with capacitors. Their experiment also failed to find the slightest trace of movement of the Earth. But by far the most famous of the experiments which tried to measure the movement of the Earth is the Michelson and Morley experiment. Albert Abraham Michelson was one of the most renowned experimental physicists in the history of science. 
when he and Edward Morley set up an apparatus called an interferometer in Cleveland, Ohio, the scientists of the world waited with bated breath for the results. Their apparatus measured speed by observing diffraction fringes. The spacing of the fringes depends on the speed at which light impacts the diffraction grating. If the Earth is moving through the ether, then the light in the interferometer moving in the direction of the Earth's motion will be facing an ether headwind, giving fringes different to the light perpendicular to the motion, which will have an ether sidewind. They planned to turn the interferometer until they got the maximum fringe shift. This would be the direction of the Earth's movement through space. The size of the fringe shift would be a measure of the speed of the Earth through space. The apparatus was so sensitive, it could detect a much smaller speed than the Earth's motion round the Sun. When the first results came out, there was consternation. No fringe shift. The Earth wasn't moving. This was hastily explained away by saying, the Earth must be going round the Sun at the same speed as the Sun is moving through space, but in the opposite direction. The two motions must have cancelled each other out. So, six months later, there should be a very big fringe shift, because the Earth would now be going in the same direction as the Sun. But six months later, the measured speed was still zero. The experiment was repeated at all hours of the day and night, at all seasons of the year, and always the Earth was not moving. This was a shocking blow. As Adolf Baker stated, failure to observe different speeds of light at different times of the year suggested that the Earth must be at rest. It was therefore the preferred frame for measuring absolute motion in space. Giancoli wrote, But this implies that the Earth is somehow a preferred object. Only with respect to the Earth would the speed of light be c as predicted by Maxwell's equations. This is tantamount to assuming that the Earth is the central body of the universe. Bernard Jaffe wrote, The data were almost unbelievable. There was only one other possible conclusion to draw, that the Earth was at rest. This, of course, was preposterous. So preposterous that some way just had to be found to get round it. Because, as J.F. Henry noted, the possibility that we have a special place in the universe is depressing to the humanist and is to be absolutely avoided. Why should that be? Well, as A.J. Burgess pointed out, the story of Christianity tells about a plan of salvation centred upon a particular people and a particular man. As long as someone is thinking in terms of a geocentric universe, the story has a certain plausibility. As soon as astronomy changes theories, however, the whole Christian history loses the only setting within which it would make sense. With the solar system no longer the centre of anything, imagining that what happens here forms the centre of a universal drama becomes simply silly. So the scientists of the world had to search desperately for a way to keep the Earth moving. Let's see how they did it next time. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.